Hi, my name's Josh Lee. I'm an animatronic model designer. I've um, been working in the film industry for quite a while now. I've um, been worked on films like, uh, my first film was The Fifth Element, and then after that I've worked on the Harry Potter series, uh, Prometheus, uh, Maleficent, uh, seven Star Wars films now, so we're looking forward to the new Star Wars film coming out soon. And um, just come here today, we've been working here in Prague for a few months on a big new Amazon TV series. So I thought I'd pop in and talk to you about how we use 3D printing in the film industry. Okay, so um, we use all sorts of 3D printing now in the film industry. Um, tr traditionally, we've made things with uh, machining and molding and casting, but um, more and more we're digitally mod modeling things, or we might, uh, with all the handheld scanners you get, um, we might um, cyber scan a person and then digitize it, work on that, and then that really suits using 3D printing because then we can model it in either hard modeling or ZBrush or something like that, and then um, use 3D printing. So we, we might use really high res stuff, really high end stuff like big SLA machines, or from mechanical parts, we might uh, get things done in nylon on an SLS. But uh, more and more, we're using uh, desktop machines like the Prusa. Um, I've got two Prusas which I use for research and development. I think the thing I like about them the most is the fact that, that I always used to sort of, um, when you're sort of got a really tight deadline on a film, um, you have to, uh, the director has a new idea and you just wish there were more hours in the day. And we used to do a lot of all-nighters to get things made. Well, now with, if you've got your own 3D printer, you can design it quickly. Uh, press print and you can go home. That's the best thing. It's, and then in the morning, you get this amazing thing that's appeared. It's like magic. And th there you are, click it off the bed and um, you're up and running again in the morning. So that's, that's been, that's, I still get a small thrill every time I come in and see this thing that's magically appeared overnight. So um, we, we we use quite a few techniques. We've, um, we've started using 3D printing in mold making. So we might uh, 3D print the sculpt. And then what you can do as well is you can 3D print a two part jacket to it with a gap around it. And you can fill that with a silicon rubber. And then you can cast that out of something and you can touch it up so you could cast that out of like a plastiline. And then you could um, f do the final sculpt and then reuse all that with a new silicon jacket. That's a really interesting technique. Um, or we've started to, uh, so the eyeballs, all the creatures that we make have eyeballs and they're very, very difficult to make. They're all different sizes. They have to be machined on the back to take the mechanism and then painted over the top. So we've started 3D printing those with all that machining in and then we paint them and put a clear casting over them. Uh, we've, we, we do heads, we use, uh, so if we cyber scan an actor, we will 3D print the head and then we'll model on a prosthetic makeup. Um, and that means the actor doesn't have to be life cast anymore, which is a, a difficult process for them. For example, um, if you wanted a dinosaur for maybe a major uh, Hollywood picture about dinosaurs, you might want to uh, take the 3D model that um, exists already, that might exist already, and then you could split it up into lots of sections, 3D print all those sections, but you're going to get joins on each one. And also the finish, the skin texture, we really pay a lot of attention to skin texture. So that probably won't be in your 3D print. So we would piece together the 3D prints like a big jigsaw and then take a mold of that and then uh, re recast it in plastiline and then take another mold and that, that plastiline can be worked up, all the joins are made. And also the thing is we need flexible skins. So, you know, the, all the skin needs to move around the neck. And uh, so when we cast out from that new mold, we use silicones or foam rubbers. So in fact, the, the, the 3D print is an incredibly good starting point for all our very complicated processes, but it, it accelerates the build uh, phenomenally, actually. 
So you could have a, you could use your best PLA for your uh, model, and then we've been using PETG for the uh, jacket, the two-part jacket, because that's nice and flexible and strong. So that's a, that's that is good enough to be able to use that as a practical part. And the best thing about that is you only have to do it once because you can reuse the jacket and just cast another silicon out of it. So there's, we're sort of inventing ways of using it because our deadlines are so tight and uh, everybody changes their mind. The director has a new brilliant idea that we, we have to respond quickly um, and it has to be economical as well. We can't be too expensive. So the um, using all the industrial 3D printers, but also using our own desktop machines means that we can be we can respond really quickly because even with the best uh, 3D print uh, professional service it's you're still looking at two or three days whereas with our own printers we can do it same day next day but we also um, we use the printer for mechanical parts as well so the PETG is a fantastic material for mechanical parts uh, it will take a thread if you tap it um, it's flexible enough to be strong, actually, it's resilient. So I've, I've, I've always printed in PLA and then got things printed in SLS nylon, but now increasingly I'm just using PETG and that will end up in the finished film prop. Yeah, so the, the, the amazing thing is that the, all the different materials sort of open up new ideas. So um, what you can do uh, with multi-head printing or, um, or multi-filament printing is uh, so recently I built a pair of hands where the joints were flexible uh, hinges 3d printed at the same time into each finger the fingers were so tiny that it's almost impossible to actually build something that um, you could put together so the, the 3d print allows you to uh, model in and print in those joints but also all the little tiny channels for cable runs or, or cabling um, the fixings you can model in and uh, the best thing about that is that uh, once you've designed a right hand you just sort of click mirror in the uh, in the slicer and then you can print uh, left hand and that was amazing because normally I have to make both sides so um, it, it, it's really sort of opened up uh, a, a huge new way of making things really, especially with the sort of democratization of 3D printing that um, I think Prusa are really um, good at. You know, so it, it allows you to, um, uh, and also I, I've picked up sort of techniques from Prusa themselves actually. So I got my, my, uh, my Mark III as a kit uh, which I got, which I bought myself for Christmas because I used to get Lego for Christmas. So, you know, I want to put a kit together um, on Boxing Day. And um, what I, I, I sort of picked up quite a few tricks actually. So I'd been trying to figure out how to uh, put threaded fasteners into 3D prints. I was swage, heat swaging in inserts and things like that. And then from the kit, I, I, I saw the the awesome power of the M3 square nut in a pocket. And I now that, use that everywhere on all my bills. I use, you know, because it, it's so simple. There's no um, post work. It's just pop the insert in, you get a nice strong fixing. Um, and also I, that's where I first came across PETG actually was by wondering what Prusa printed these things in because it seemed so strong. Um, also, you know, chamfering corners rather than radiusing them so that you get a nice print. Uh, I think all things like that, I, I think I, all, I learned all that from building the kit actually. And now I sort of use all that in all my prints. We, we, the, the movie that started our experience was probably Prometheus actually. We started to use it on that. Um, but the one that has we've really developed it on, on the Star Wars films. So um, at the beginning of those, so I, I built BB-8 and at the beginning of those, we, we 3D printed the masters of um, BB-8 and then we used silicon molding, silicon injection molding techniques to create all of those. Um, but towards the end of Star Wars, I was actually 3D printing the whole BB, you know, not whole BB-8s, but the actual parts so we sort of really developed it 
on that and we started to use it for mold making, started to use it for mechanical parts, just because there's um, very little time and we have to create, a, a, to populate the, a film like Star Wars with creatures, um, you need, and droids, um, you need a lot of stuff and, and of course you, know, you can create a lot of stuff on a 3D printer very, very quickly and economically. Uh, the thing that I would like to see with printing is I would, I'd like a large format FDM printer that um, works well really because we, we build, like if you're going to build a dinosaur you, 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 you could tile it out of pieces this big but that's a lot of work to split it up so if they were just a bit bigger and also um, a human head we, we have to print those quite a lot so uh, bigger I mean there is a problem with bigger because the volume increases you know uh, not exponentially but uh, you know so the, the speed of it is it becomes a problem um, as you get bigger but um, that would be if there was what I'd really like to do next is to have a farm at work print farm at work where we're um, rather than using outside companies to use um, like industrial processes um, to make large prints sort of this sort of size I'd love to be able to have a farm at work where we could just print them because then it's better for us because we don't have problem with secrecy because it's all done in-house um, our deadlines are tight like I say so it'll all be done as quickly as it can be and, and often sometimes if there is a even if there's a problem with a print uh, a, an outside company might reject it but we would accept it um, because we can we know that we can fill it or file it so um, I think that's the next thing would be a large format farm that's what I want to see so um, it's really great for me because animatronics has, has made a sort of comeback um, in the last eight years really and I think the reason is there's a um, so I worked on I worked on a number of films when it was very heavily CGI a lot of blue screen just a few props really just a table and some props and it there's a there's a, a, a few reasons really the first reason is it it's more exciting when there are animatronics on set when there's a big set behind you and that um, excitement of the crew and the actors I think sort of builds this sense of momentum which comes across in the film actually. So um, if you're working with, um, you, I think you get a better performance from the actors. I think directors know that you get a better performance because they're reacting with something. Um, it's also very difficult for the CGI guys. If As soon as um, a real person touches an object, that's incredibly difficult to do in CGI, that sort of physics. And also, um, the, uh, there's, there's a sort of reality to animatronics, which sometimes you don't get in CGI. Sometimes you do, but sometimes you don't. There's sort of all the physics works, things have momentum and weight. And, um, and, and also they're, they're sort of, there's something quite charming about animatronics as well, which I think comes across. Um, the other reason is we're cheaper. So we're still cheaper. Um, so as soon as you, uh, as soon as you do more than a couple of shots, it's expensive making animatronics. But as soon as you get more than a couple of shots, we're probably cheaper than um, than uh, CGI. And of course, you know the producers are always looking at balancing the books. So the, the good the good thing is that in the last few years, there's been this lovely balance. Um, come about between CGI and animatronics where we'll build a puppet but we're less constrained by having to hide people and hide rods because the CGI has come on so much that they can remove all the people and then if the character has to get up and walk across the room they'll then take that over we still can't do that as well as they can so there's this there's this great balance now to it which I think really um, is making films look really great I can't figure out why it is that, so <coughs> animatronics seem to age better than CGI and I can't really figure out why that is. I think it's something about um, the charm of, of puppets really and, and you're, 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 I think people, audiences are more uh, willing to accept it. Um, and I think it might be something to do with um, your eye knowing or your brain knowing that um, the physics of objects 
uh, works or doesn't work. And so, you know, we're constrained by gravity and momentum when we're filming, whereas sometimes they're not in CGI, certainly the older stuff. So I think somehow um, it does seem to age better. I don't know what that is. The, the thing about a film set is that um, it, it, I think it's, it's often quoted that it's a thousand dollars a minute for a, a film set. So if you keep them waiting on a film set, you will have someone standing over you going thousand dollars a minute, thousand dollars a minute. Um, so the, the emphasis is on never holding them up, always being ready. Um, uh, so you've got to sort of preempt what they want and also things have to be reliable, things, things can't break. They will understand if, if they do occasionally, but um, I, I try and get at least two months of filming in before I'll admit to a breakage on set because they, they just do not wait. Um, it's a very high pressure environment, but good, but good fun. Uh, well, we have a whole department who do the electronics, so they build their own PCBs really, so it's all um, quite high-end stuff that um, I, I think the, the thing that I've, the thing that I've um, found recently is that you can make one object. So if you're making an arm, for instance, you might have the, the palm shape and you, make, you can make a single object, which uh, is, the, is the skeleton underneath the skin, but is also mounting your electronics, um, uh, mounting your servos, running your cables, um, if you get it printed in metal, that can be your heat sink as well. For, or, so um, the, the thing that I've sort of um, come across lately is that the, these are almost becoming products now. It's almost, you know, it, with, with all the 3D CAD and 3D printing and 3D scanning, we've, uh, that's all in our hands now as makers. We, I'm, we're, I'm just a prop maker, you know, and um, so all those industrial techniques are available to everyone, really. And so you can end up with inc incredibly sophisticated objects that um, just five, six years ago would have involved um, many different objects bolted together. And I think that's the th thing that I've noticed recently. <laughs> I, don't, I don't get to keep any of the props, nothing. They're, uh, they're all, uh, especially things on Harry Potter and Star Wars, they all become priceless, really. So, and it's my job to keep them, once I've built them, I protect the, uh, the look of them. I make sure they don't get photographed because there are paparazzi trying to photograph these things during filming. I keep it a secret for, for years and then I make sure they're secure and um, give them to the production. And some of them, I mean, it's really nice. Some of them end up in museums. That's incredible. Something that you've made um, ends up in the Smithsonian. That's uh, amazing. But I don't have a single thing <laughs> that I've made. It's a very strange existence. Um, I, again, all those designs belong to the production company that I'm working for. So, and, and to be honest, uh, after a year of filming, I've, I've had enough. <laughs> I think I've built, um, I think I, last count, I think I built 28 different versions of BB-8. So to be honest, I've, I've, um, I, I, you know, I don't really need one of my own. <laughs> uh, what the, 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 the best thing about my job is that uh, every film, you get a very clever director and writers coming up with new challenges. So the, what I really enjoy is someone saying, oh, wouldn't, wouldn't it be great if we could get a robot that did that? And then, and then that's the, it's like being given a puzzle and then you have to work that out. So I, I really enjoy just getting those puzzles from, from the director, from the writers and um, figuring it out. I'm not very good actually at inventing the puzzles myself. That's, well, that's where the enjoyment is. <laughs>